My name is Helani Sonora Pale, and I'm a Kia Iwai of Oahu. I was born and raised on this Mokupuni. I am indigenous Kanaka Maui. My family can trace their genealogy to time immemorial to this Rahi, to this place. Um, I have a kuleana to protect all that is sacred, and um, the biggest threat right now we have collective. <laughs> collectively is the military. So we're here to talk about demilitarizing Oceania from Hawaii to Palestine and and, find, and have a discussion. This is a discussion that we're going to have. Okay. Uh, so just some housekeeping. Uh, we um, do, we're going to be having some healers come. Um, they're not here yet, but if anybody feels triggered at any time, um, Please, you know, tap my shoulder or tap Alakai, Alakai shoulder um, if you're feeling triggered at any time during this discussion. Mahalo. Uh, restrooms. Restrooms are in the back corner, so you know, can, and, and we also have food outside. So this is a very relaxed setting. Please don't feel bad about standing up to to go get food. There's drinks outside. Help yourself. Um, and the agenda. So we're gonna we're gonna start with our panelist, and then we're gonna go into a discussion. And at the very end, Ina Ilaskonia will be doing a special presentation um, for us. And we we should finish by eight thirty. Okay. So I want to just introduce the panelists here. And first of all, I want to mahalo all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be here and to be part of this conversation. Alakai um, Kapunui, who opened this up with our Oli, she is a Kia'i of Mauna Wakea, a Pohakuloa of Kaloko Loko Ia, she's a Kia'i of Palestine and all sacred places. She's a founder of Kuliao Onawai Kapu. Kona for Palestine and a longtime member of Hui Aloha Aina. So that is Alaka'i Kapanui. Mahalo. Mahalo Alaka'i. And Kalamai, if this seems like long, but because we're here, you know, in, in, in a very feminist um, in, uh, space empowering women, I really want to take the time to acknowledge the women that are speaking today. So I'm going to just read their bios so that you understand um, all that they've done and what they're speaking from and for. Um, Kanalani Malia Gomes is a Kanaka Maui, a Filipino storyteller, land and water defender, and emerging healer. Makanalani was born on Oahu and was raised on the moku of Ewa, Oahu, and Puna, Hawaii. She holds this aina these Ainas, as well as her Ohana family and community, as her first teachers and sources of wisdom. Makanalani's connection to local and global decolonization and demilitarization movements to protect human and indigenous rights and health of Mother Earth. In April of 2024, she completed her two-year term as one of the three co-chairs of the United Nations Global Indigenous Youth Caucus, where she spoke on a panel at the United Nations headquarters 
in New York City at the 23rd United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues on the Importance of the Role of Indigenous Youth. And I see a lot of Indigenous youth in this room, and that's very heartening. Um, okay, so we're going to off. Okay, in uh, self-determination. Makanalani uh, has served the caucus for over five years, three as Pacific Focal Point and two as co-chair. She is also a master's candidate at Kamakapuo Kalani Center for Hawaiian Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, a student of Hawaiian healing traditions in Hula. She is a core member of Affirm Hawaii, her community organizing home and sisterhood. She is a part of a team of Kanaka Maoli women working on the second report of the murdered, missing Native Hawaiian women and, women and girls and Mahu, third gender people's task force. A groundbreaking initiative to understand and make visible the experiences of violence facing these communities. The greatest work she has ever been called to remains the protection of Mauna Awakia, where she spent six months on the front lines protecting sacred ancestral lands and waters and opposing the building of the 30 meter telescope. So, mahalo makana. Thank you for being here, I'm very honored. Um, Ihilani Lasconia uh, is one of another panelist that we have here. Um, she is a Kanaka Uwili artist, organizer, and Haumana or Waimanalo O'ahu. As an activist and transnationalist feminist, Ihilani is a member of Affirm Hawaii a Wahine-led organization centered on ending, ending patriarchal violence through decolonization and anti-imperialism. They are a graduate student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and their research looks at historical and contemporary connections between Hawaii and Palestine. As an artist, Ihilani's mediums of work are hip-hop and poetry. Their inspiration is rooted in the geopolitical landscape of Hawaii and their experience being queer and native in the 21st century. That's Ihilani Maskonia. Our third panelist is Natalie Segovia. She is a Quechua international human rights attorney whose work as executive director of the Water Protector Legal Collective an indigenous-led legal organization born out of no DAPL, Resistance at Standing Rock, focuses on the protection of water protectors and frontline defenders, the earth, and indigenous peoples affected by forced displacement, desecration of sacred lands, and human rights violations due to extractive industry, militarization, or development projects in the context of a just transition. Over the past 20 years, Natalie's international work included human rights field work documenting violations in rural, unseen areas in countries including Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, and Brazil, as well as presenting testimony and shadow reports at the United Nations. A frequent lecturer in law in 2022, she was named Developer, Distinguished Public Interest Lecturer at Northeastern University School of Law and taught in defense of the sacred human rights, earth, justice, and the law. Natalie holds a law degree from Arizona State University and dual degrees in political science and Latin American studies from Columbia University. She currently serves on the scientific committee of the People's Academy of International Law on the Board of Directors for Indigenous Peoples' Rights International. Mahalo, thank you so much, Natalie, for being here. <laughs> I will introduce our last panelist when she gets here. <laughs> She's doing important work, that's for sure. She's, she has been a leader in our community for over 30 years. So if she's not here by now, she's doing something important, she will be here, that's for sure. Okay, and then, um, and then I did introduce myself. So I just wanted to um, acknowledge all of the work um, and um, the, you know, everything that they are, are here representing and the work that they have um, done in the past. Um, so we're going to get started. Um, and I am the facilitator for tonight. Okay. Oh, come on, Adam, Adam, oh, 
Um, and we're going to start with Makana Lani, who has been working on the missing, murdered, native Hawaiian women and girls, and Mahu um, report part two, um, so that we kind of get a background about what this is about and, and how important it is right now to be focused on women's safety. And, you know, before we start, maybe I should just kind of give you a kind of a little background of how this came about. So a group of us, women activists, organizers in the community, were concerned about women's safety during RIMPAC. Um, RIMPAC is starting at the end of June, and one of the participants in RIMPAC is Israel. Um, Native Hawaiian women and girls are the most vulnerable populations here in our homeland. And so we wanted to have, start having a discussion about that and how we can hopefully create systems of safety. Um, and, and what are some of the, some ideas that we could implement to protect our people during this time? I mean, ideally, you know, everyone should be signing on to the um, Jewish Voices for Peace petition, which is like, don't come here, period. But if, you know, we may not have any choice at this point. But um, we're hopeful. Okay, so we're gonna start with Makanalani. Mahalo. Mahalo, mahalo nui ya opo pakakia pao. Mahalo for our foremothers. Eo hong mea hewa hine. Ali wa yuwa, you know, to the to the multifaceted, um, mysterious, wondrous, hong mea, earth mother. Kobaha no moku papa tuaniku as I see all of our indigenous um, and militants across Oceania, the great Moana Nui Akea. Mahalo for coming um, to all of our relatives and especially to all of the people that I look around, um, both of my generation before us and those to come. Mahalo for, for being here, for being um, the warrior people that we were always called to be in. And I look forward to, to no longer having to be warrior people, um, only when we have to be and not all of us. Mahalo. Um, I am the community organizer investigator on part two, which is the, um, the quantitative, so the, what I like to say is the talk story. Um, so we get entrusted uh, by our community to hold the stories of survivors, of families of the survivors of really this, um, in Hawaii, an epidemic, but really a pandemic across the whole world, across the world of murdered, missing women, girls, and our two-spirit, um, trans, or gender, mahu folks. Um, and the, the primary, the principal investigator is Dr. Nikki Cristobal, who is from Kauai. Um, and so bear with me if I'm a little nervous. Um, I come from Waipio and Puna, very, a lot of water, a lot of, uh, a lot of fire, a lot of water and um, energy going on in me. So I invite that if you're a little nervous. Um, or just a little activated, um, you know, to take a deep breath anytime you see me breathing through this report, because this is the first time I'm actually um, presenting on the qualitative part of it. And, and numbers aren't really my thing. I'm not a, I'm not a math girl. My math doesn't really help math all the time. Um, with that being said, we can go to the next slide. So, um, you know, we wanted to recognize the generations, and as I said, that came before us. Um, and all of the ind indigenous ancestral knowledge and systems that we hope to activate and really lean into in this um, and to know that there are systems beyond the world that we are living in that will guide us. And so what we commit to is, is, is those indigenous ancestral knowledge systems and those values of our Kanaka. We're all Kanaka on the report, so we have a survivor, myself as a community organizer, and a doctor in the festival. Um, and we really understand that it's multifaceted. We are incorporating not just intergenerational indigenous knowledge, but we are also in holding on to 
and you know untangling and unlearning and relearning around inter intergenerational um, trauma as well as that wisdom. And so we acknowledge that this is also integrated in immigrant communities and their descendants. As I said, I want to acknowledge that um, you know Festival of the Pacific, and so we are hosting our relatives here of the great um, Oceania. And so we would invite everyone in this space to recognize their, ans their ancestors and the events of history that brought you here, as well as the work um, you are engaged in, um, in to support the collective liberation and healing now and for future generations. Just a uh, next slide. Um, so a brief uh, history of Mo'opoho, uh, our genealogy. This was um, born out of a resolution um, that was passed by a former representative Representative Stacey Lynch, the former representative Stacey Lynch, Eli from Manakuli and um, you know parts of the west side and that the west side of this island houses the most native Hawaiians um, and she understood the need for it and so we were able to pass that resolution and in um, December of 2022 we were able to uh, collectively launch the report in community with all of our protectors and good hunters and so that's the genealogy of this and really this genealogy comes from a lot of our First Nations um, indigenous relatives across um, the world, specifically um, Turtle Island and what is so-called Canada and so-called the United States. So we will honor them as well and how we're learning in community with them. Next slide, please. So the summary of the key findings were 21% um, of uh, Hawaii's population that identified as Native Hawaiians um, that were either murdered or missing. 10.2% um, of the Hawaii's population identified as native Hawaiian female. I'm sorry, the 21% is Hawaii's population identified. 21% of our population here in Hawaii identify as native Hawaiian. 10.2% uh, identify as native Hawaiian female, and 0.49% identify of our population identify um, as <laughs> underage native Hawaiian, so under the age of 18. Next slide. Another key finding is that the average profile of a missing child is a 15-year-old female, Kanaka Maoli, um, missing on Oahu, specifically Waikiki. Um, so, you know, I, I know a lot of our relatives are staying in this area, and, um, you know, amihi that it is not what it should be, um, but I dream of the world that it will be Waikiki again, where the ways are nourishing instead of being extracted. So please um, heed this, heed this, this data, this statistic um, when you are traversing in Waikiki. Another key finding. Sorry, next slide. And thank you to our our PowerPoint technology person and to the Akua who are all in charge of the technology um, that they're aligning with us right now. Um, Two thousand is the number of cases of missing children in Hawaii each year. Excellent. So some more key findings, 25% 20, of missing gr girls in Hawaii are Kanaka Maoli. 43% um, percent were sex trafficking, identified as sex trafficking. Um, and again, those being um, trafficked, again, were frequenting Waikiki. Um, this is a, it's a little distorted, but um, it's a helpful timeline. I think, you know, in my own family, and, and, and I do share that my family endured two folks uh, that did go missing. I have an, I had an aunt, an auntie, and uh, my cousin, um, who was male, that both went missing um, due to mental health crisis. But luckily, in the first 48 hours, we were able to find them, um, and they were able to be returned home. But this is, one part that I, I find very helpful because, and this is, you know, the, the, I want to acknowledge that this work was done in, in collaboration with folks who have produced um, the research ahead of time and, and transcriptions um, or interpretations of our Olala Hawaii that have showed us that this was not our practice, that it was brought to our shores. You know, the abstraction and, the, and, and not understanding um, that we are sacred and that this sort of um, sex trade or extraction of our, of our bodies, much like the extraction of our water and our extraction of the minerals of our water um, are not of us. And so I think for me and, and for my family and, and for many of the families that we've sat with, you know, we're not 
We're not to blame. Is there accountability? Absolutely, but we are not to blame for this. This is not of us, and there are ways um, in, you know, in community and together that we can free ourselves of that. Um, I, I think I just want to skip through some of the, to ensure that we um, are on time, but a summary of the driving factors is that, um, you know, folks, it are, but they, that again, these are, there are systemic issues here that are driving folks um, into um, the sex trade, you know, high poverty risk, and those are identified as anywhere from age 15 and 25 um, at poverty statistics of Kanaka Maoli and women and girls who are experiencing this. Um, and I think some of the last maybe summary of driving factors. And so 83% of, um, of known sex traffickers in Hawaii um, are male and, most, and their most common relationship um, that a trafficker has um, with a victim is, is a pimp. Um, and 71% is trafficking victims are below the age of 19. And then 46%, 0.8 um, of those human trafficking cases are commercial sexual sexual exploitation of the, of the child. Um, and so if we can go to the current um, directions. So right now we are actively working on part two, the story collecting. Um, and so we're, we're looking for the, to increase, you know, representation across um, our oceanic relatives in, into the report. Um, of course, we're centering Native Hawaiians, but we also know that they're using the ocean. Instead of using it to connect us, they're using it as a ways to exploit us and um, to carry our, literally carry our bodies across um, through the sex trade. Um, again, and we also are, are trying to, you know, ensure that we are including our mahu and our third gender folks in, in the report and more um, of their narratives and their stories. Um, we are community driven and um, we are trying to integrate um, a community care toolkit. We do have one. There is a QR code with both the first part of the report and um, a small one, one pager. It's back in front of um, kind of the description of why it's necessary. And then on, on the back in, in the event during RIMPAC, someone should um, find themselves being exploited or harmed during RIMPAC. Um, so that is just the, the part, the foundation of where we want to go and integrate a longer toolkit that we've seen being done, again, across Turtle Island um, in our relatives, Dene, who are um, from Dene or Navajo Nation, um, that we were given some guidance from them. Um, if you just go to the Mahalo. So just mahalo to those that are collaborating us with us on the um, report and um, to our matriarchs, our relatives, our mothers, our aunties, our sisters in the struggle here with us today, all of you for showing up because I know that this work calls people in um, because it is such a heavy, it's such a, it's komaha, right? And komaha is heavy and it's, but it's meant to be lifted. And I know as I look around the room, each and every one of you, especially having our relatives across Mona Nuiakea here that, um, again, we will rise and we will not we will not drown in, in the various ways. Climate change, those extracting our lands and our waters and our bodies, we we will call all of them in. We will call land back, we will call Moana back, we will call our bodies back. And so I don't want to take up any more time. I apologize if I'm nervous. Numbers are not my friend. <laughs> um, but just if you know my um, Dr. Nikki Cristobal. Um, has a wonderful baby who is just shy of two months old and couldn't be here with us. So, so I was just her stand in, <laughs> just the second fiddle. Um, I wish I could play the fiddle. Actually, I wish I could play the viola. <laughs> That's a side. Um, <laughs> um, but please contact us. Um, she that is her cell phone as well. That's my cell or my WhatsApp, um, and that you can reach us on if you are feeling called um, to support this work or you have a story to share. Um, or you want to be, however we can support you um, as we all forge forward in this work. Um, because no more stolen sisters, no more stolen relatives, no more stolen land. Um, so
Mahalo Kano for that and the amazing work that you do. Yeah. Although again, my name is Ikigane, so I'm a novel, uh, a place where also is Chok Kanaka and the places of uh, MMIWG or MMM and HWG. The acronym gets longer every single time, but it's good to be more inclusive. Uh, it's a place where that happens and you know that you know, thinking about MMIWG, MMM, NHWG, this crisis is so heavily connect connected to the two systems that suppress us the most, which is tourism and militarization, um, which is what I'll be talking about a little bit today. Um, incredibly timely, given that it's a RIMPAC year, but also incredible that we get to have this conversation because it's also FESPA. So in the midst of all this, like, Omaha and this, all this EHA, uh, seeing our, our brothers and sisters and our siblings from Juan and Nuyakea show up for us has been incredibly amazing. Shout out to the Aotearoa delegation for rocking a kufia. I don't know if you were there, but it was... That was you! Thank you! Boy. Shout out to whoever made the lao lao. That was incredible. If you didn't have any lao lao yet, you should try it. They weren't scared to chill fat and bless them because I'm a little woozy, but it's all good. All good. Hello again, I'll be talking about Pai uh, particularly the Hawaiian archipelago uh, to Palestina or Palestine, talking about militarization as it relates to the rib pack. Uh, but U.S. imperialism, settler colonialism, and American occupation, and the ways in which I want to encourage folks to think about the occupation of Hawaii and Palestine is that they're both uh, occupation projects backed by the United States. Although Israel is the occupying country, Israel would not exist as it does today, if at all, if it weren't for the United States funding them. So thinking about and blaming and holding the United States accountable, even if they're proposing for a ceasefire now, it's too late. Even before October 7, like they had two generations now to pull out of this occupying force. So understand that the U.S. is heavily interconnected uh, to Israel. It's not uh, a separate state, but an extension of U.S. imperialism. And so if we could go into the next slide, that would be incredible. So just an overview to stay organized. Uh, I'll be looking at uh, occupation of Hawaii and Palestine. I'm looking at demilitarization in context, Palapala uh, Aina, or maps, and Nupepa, or Nupeper, articles of Palestine or Palestine. He couldn't be here today, uh, but I want to give a special shout out to Kobe Lamahi, my best friend, and someone who's been doing uh, this type of research, um, and has this, this music with me, in relation to Palestine, uh, for years now. So he couldn't be here. Shout out to him. And then some key takeaways, and I'll wrap it up there. Next slide, please. So looking at demilitarization in context, so how did this EK, how did this knowledge come to be and what kuleana or responsibility do I have contributing to this body of knowledge? So I think it's important if I'm going to talk about something that I'm passionate about, that I have to show the kapua or the foundation that I stand on. There's a lot of folks who just talk, 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 but I feel like I was able to speak here today because in the words of Kumu Hanani Trask, I've done my homework at least a, a little bit. Uh, so looking at why we should be talking about this, demilitarization in context is understanding our Lahui, the Hawaiian nation, Hawaiian people, and understanding that there's also an epidemic of conservatism and right-wing ideology that's plaguing our peoples. And we see this in other communities of color as well, uh, where because we're in dire straits, especially post-pandemic, uh, that conservatism has told people of color, has told Native peoples that if you align yourselves with settler colonialism and if you align yourselves with white supremacy that you'll reap the benefits that suppressed you so that white people could have it in the first place. So understanding that the struggle and the fight right now is a physical one but it's also an ideological one and seeing a lot of Kanaka Maoli uh, predominantly like in, in heavily concentrated Native Hawaiian communities like the West Side, Manalo, like having this ideological shift to conservatism and Hawaiians aligning themselves with Israel because we're not all on the same side here politically um, has been devastating. And the reason why is because of colonialism and because of our occupation that keeps Kamaka Maoli strategically uninformed about our history and the U.S.'s history at that. So understanding that uh, while I'm here today, there's folks that I love so much in my community that are still struggling with this. And I hope in having these conversations that we can go out into our communities today and talk about it. Yeah, it's not just about this panel. Also talking about the kuhua I stand on. Um, an intellectual mo'oku how an intellectual genealogy is incredibly important. 
I never not knew that I was Kalakla Mawli. I always understood that. But in terms of being politically conscious and understanding that my identity as Kalakla Mawli is heavily rooted, or should have be heavily rooted, in the fight for the occupation is something that I've only been in the game with for seven years, and I'm like not afraid to admit that because that's the more typical experience of Kalakla Mawli living in Hawaii. But when I got my ono, uh, my hunger, this desire for Ea Hawaii, Hawaiian sovereignty, Kumu, uh, like Noi Lani Goodyear Kaupua, Kupuna Vai Wright, Cindy Franklin, uh, Jimmy Ko, oh, sorry, was my advisor. I promise I'm going to get my proposal and just, I'll work on it tonight. I promise. Uh, it's intellectual Mo'opua Ho. I didn't learn or get the hunger for Hawaiian sovereignty in our history, culture, and language without being fed the ono or desire to learn about Palestine. Even if you look at the intellectual Mo'opua Ho, Kumu Hananike Trask, in her writings and in her speeches, she is mentioning Palestine. She talks about the Congo, she talks about West Papua. And so understanding that the fight for a sovereign Hawaii is also a fight for a deoccupied Palestine, and that our solidarity is never, should never be conditional. It's the same problem um, that goes into solidarity. Um, and one of the reasons why I wanted to focus on my research, but also my life's work in organizing around Palestine, uh, is seeing how Palestinians showed up for us on the Mauna, you know, there wasn't an Israeli flag there. Hell no. The Palestinian flag, the Palestine flag was there. Um, and I was just brought to tears and my heart has been molded in a different way. Seeing Palestinians in Bethlehem and Gaza and other parts of Palestine holding up signs in support of Mauna Kea and sending that to us. The fact that our, our occupation, it's, it's heavily militarized, but we're not facing violence in the same ways that they are. And the fact that they showed a law for us and have a law for I, our Ainan under such dire consequences made me feel so compelled to connect these struggles and speak up. Um, and also building relationships uh, with, with Palestinians. Uh, so folks in this picture, uh, Han, uh, who's, who's from Palestine, um, getting to bring Palestinians every year to Hawaii and building that relationship um, has motivated me uh, to build solidarity. Um, yeah, and then art as activism, so as an artist, as an organizer, using hip hop as a political tool, uh, political education is something I'm super interested in. Uh, Khan and I have dropped many a banner. That's one of them that we never got to call. Okay, maybe this is another good uh, our, our, our tag is on the, on the thing. Anyways, just kidding. Someone, it was someone else named Ina Lihi. Anyways, on this side, please. Oh, it's Lala was hitting. Um, <laughs> so some major sections, I'm going to try and go through this to be conscious of time, is the occupation of Hawaii and Palestine, Israel and Hawaii in the Pacific, especially with Rimpat and solidarity between Hawaii and Palestine. Next slide, please. So three quick sections, breaking it down. So Daniel K. Inouye, Rimpat and militarization, and Larry Ellison, all three things that you should be conscious with if you're living in Hawaii or visiting Hawaii. So Daniel K. Inouye, uh, if you flew in, or if you've ever left Hawaii, there is an airport named after him. He's the most celebrated non-Israeli politician in Israel. So in the context of Israel, there's seldom anything named after any non-Israeli. And he's the only US politician or non-Israeli politician to have something named after him. And it's a weapons testing site uh, and a missile testing site that's named after Daniel Kekinoi. And that's because out of every single U.S. politician, he was arguably the largest catalyst for the U.S. supporting Israel. And so he was able to rise in political power because of settler colonialism in Hawaii. And in deoccupied and a sovereign Hawaii, uh, the support for Zionism, I believe, would not exist. So our settlers are able to conduct genocide and support other occupations because of our own occupation here at home. So, yeah, so making that connection between settler colonialism Settlers are able to align themselves with white supremacy in the U.S. because we are we are occupied. And if we were free, that wouldn't happen. Uh, next is uh, RIMPAC, militarization. RIMPAC stands for Rim of the Pacific, as previously stated by Hayalani. Uh, Israel has been invited this year and has been invited uh, I think since like its inception, or at least post 1948. It's military war games, including Israel. Uh, Lockheed Martin, uh, whose headquarters are about two miles from this place, uh, so not very far at all. They're huge, huge weapons manufacturers and producers. And the really problematic thing about this is that during RIMPAT, particularly off the shores of uh, Bobar Archipelago, but also at Pohakulua, and uh, even before in Makua, they would test these weapons, uh, these bombs, but also surveillance technology. 
And then at the convention center, uh, where FESPAC is largely being held right now, the, one of the world's largest arms deals will be held in that convention center, where the weapons tested on our Aina and on our Vai would be sold to states such as Israel. And so thinking about how Lockheed Martin has headquarters here, and it's being, our Aina and our Vai is being desecrated, but then these weapons are being sold to another occupying state to be used physically on Palestinians. We may be far away, but that connection is, there's nothing more intimate than that type of violence. And it's happening in Hawaii so that it can happen in other places in the world. And while we're talking about Rintak and militarization, uh, talking about uh, Red Hill, Kapuka, Ki, uh, we're really happy that these tanks are being drained, but it's also at the expense of Olongapo and Filipinos, where that fuel is now being moved to the Philippines. And while I'm really happy uh, for Hawaii, I would be remiss to say that I'm not furious for the Philippines as well, where our tank shouldn't be drained just for the suppression of other people. So thinking about how that solidarity has to go hand in hand, uh, and how we can't just fight for our own freedom without being conscious of others as well. Last but not least, Larry Allison, such a jerk. Um, yeah, it's weird. Uh, owns a majority of the Na'i, which he purchased only about, I think, 200 million dollars, which is like chunk change to a billionaire. And he used uh, uh, Lanai between 2019 and 2022 to protect Benjamin Netanyahu, who's been charged with countless war crimes. Um, it's even been taken to Geneva. But uh, in order to evade persecution in the United States um, and also in Israel, because he's that bad, that Israelis are like, we don't like him that much, it's crazy, right? Um, he used Lanai to shield him, and has also used Lanai uh, for other AI development and testing sites through Oracle, which is the company that's generated him uh, so much money. Uh, so thinking about Daniel K. Inouye, Rim Packet Militarization, and Larry Ellison, none of these things would be tolerated in a deoccupied Hawaii whatsoever. Next slide, please. Um, so taking it uh, outside of the context of just Hawaii, Israel, Hawaii, and Pacific, there was a huge opposition where Pacific countries made up a majority of countries throughout the entire world who opposed a ceasefire in Gaza. And that was the UN General Assembly's vote held on October 27th. Um, if you just Google that, there's a, a four-page report on that. But some of these countries in the Pacific who voted no to a ceasefire were Fiji, Tonga, Papua New Guinea, Marshall Islands, Nauru, and the Federated States of Micronesia. A majority of the countries who voted no were countries in the Pacific and so when we talk about recognition, when we talk about sovereignty, if that sovereignty is state-centric and based on Westphalian or Eurocentric notions of governance, for whole, lose money. So many of these Pacific countries have more in common with Palestine and Israel. And we've seen that, and we keep on seeing that throughout this week. I mean, shout out to Fiji for talking about New Caledonia and West Papua, because they hold it now. folks in smaller countries needed to align themselves with the Eurocentric notions of sovereignty in order to be seen. And for us as Kamakamali, there's sovereignty and then there's air. And that's the thing I'm most hungry for, air, life, breath to rise. Yes, it can contain sovereignty, but if we can't see each other outside of Western notions of the state, then do we really understand what it means to be in community and to be in relation? And we're talking about how Moana do Yakea, this ocean is what connects us and divides us. But what's dividing us right now are these, in, these invisible and like, these imaginary lines of what a state is. Uh, but yeah, yeah. moving on, uh, trying to speed up a little bit, uh, evangelical movements and being aligned with the US. You can't talk about colonization without talking about Christianity and Mormonism. And I have a lot for folks who are religious. So many folks in the African community are Christian, Catholic, or another Abrahamic religion. But you can't deny yourself from the fact that folks are politically motivated to align themselves with Israel because of Christianity. And Christianity, as someone who's grown up in the church, teaches folks to support Zionism. Mm. So you can't separate that. Uh, and looking again as a step towards being taken seriously by other imperial powers is to align ourselves with the US or France or Britain, other imperial powers who support Zionism. Again, looking at Ea for sovereignty. Sovereignty, such as the West, is based on rights and ownership, where air, life, sovereignty, breath, to rise, is based on belonging, rooted in language, culture, and community consciousness, and an all encompassing uh, of what it's all encompassing of what it means to truly be free. So the, the fun part is solidarity. Uh, while we're bogged down by BS settler politicians, 
Lockheed Martin, uh, Rimpac, uh, there's never not been an incredible and intimate joy shared between Kalafgar Palestinians, both in Hawaii and within Palestine. You see right here, um, top left corner is the Palestinian flag, and the Mauna, Sumaya Awad, Helani and I, cruising at St. Franklin's house, an incredible Jewish ally to Palestinians, and Kanaka Maoli, Palestinians supporting Mauna Kea, a map of Palestine that was uh, carved in the 1800s, and the Luna, which I'll talk about a little bit, Malia Osorio, who's not in the house, but shout out to Malia Osorio, um, for building that solidarity for years now, and an incredible portrait of Hanani K. Trask um, that was painted by an incredible Palestinian artist. Okay, next slide, please. And so I'll 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 put the through this. I'll call the mic for talking quite long. But what I, what I want people to understand uh, is that the intimate relationship, the diplomacy, and the friendship that Palestinians and Hawaiians had exists long before the occupation of Palestine and Hawaii. And we can see that uh, with these key or these images that are carved of Palestine at Lahaina Next slide, please. And so shout out to Kawila Mahi, uh, who's done the research to date this up uh, from Hawaii Nation Archives. So these are some colorful la'aina of Palestina, uh, both on the left and right side. And I think this really speaks to how well you understand a people and a place when the names of their rivers, their mountains, and their seas have a word, mahwala lahubai, or in the Hawaiian language. As Kamaka, you don't talk about a place, you don't write about a place unless you know it and it's people. If not, that's mahawai, that's being nosy. So this map alone is just evidence of how well we've been in relation with Palestinians. Next slide, please. So connecting these struggles of Lahaina and Palestine, also shout out to Kawila for this, uh, is when it comes to water issues, land issues, Lahaina itself, Maui itself has always been on the forefront of protecting the lands and waters, as Lamea Hoshino. And then Hassan Kalafani says, the Palestinian cause is not a cause for Palestinians only, but a cause for every revolutionary, wherever he is, as a cause of the exploited and oppressed masses in that era. So these two issues, what's happening in Lahaina, what happened in Lahaina, what's happening in Palestine, they're both products of US occupation and imperialism. <coughs> these problems wouldn't exist if they weren't for that. Next slide, please. Uh, we, saw, we also have uh, Kani Kao, or a dirge, a chant of lamentation uh, that was written with Timoteo Ha'alilio, and it also references the beauty of Palestine within this dirge. Next slide, please. And there's also over 100 uh, new pepper, one language newspaper article entries talking about Palestine, talking about Gaza, talking about Bethlehem, I mean, in beautiful ways, in ways that don't even mention occupation because it's not even something that's in our consciousness. Um, yeah, this is, this is in the 1800s. Uh, yeah, so if you want to look at that, just briefly. Yeah, entries of Palestine in the new pepper. Next slide, please. And there's also different only that are, that are included. I'm going to read this poem by Fadwa Tukan, who has been incredible in getting uh, not just Palestinians, but also Hawaiians to think about our own occupation, but also the beauty of being in community. Uh, Fadwa says, Enough for me to die in her earth, to be buried in her, to melt and vanish into her soil, to sprout forth as a flower, played with by a child for my country. Enough for me to remain in my country's embrace, to be in her close as a handful of dust, a sprig of grass, a flower. Yeah. And for me, if that's not Allah Aina, then I don't know what is. And that can be expressed in any language or by any peoples. Um, and, and as indigenous peoples, being able to see post land, post Aina through their eyes is something that Palestinians have always compelled us to do. Next slide, please. So key takeaways while I wrap up. The occupation of Hawaii and Palestine are both settler colonial projects backed by US imperialism occupation of Hawaii and the occupation of Palestine to Israel wouldn't exist if it weren't for the United States. And when we envision and fight for our own sovereignty, uh, cannot be at the uh, other people's suffering, thinking about Pacific nations aligning themselves with Israel um, and all that, that kind of heva. Um, if you truly want to be free, it's not going to come uh, from Western-centric notions of recognition. It's sure as hell not going to come from the UN, where we have to play this game for generations. I work in the UN is a def definitely a, a, a heavy and critical component, but there's so many other different ways to fight for air um, that comes from solidarity outside of the state recognition. And last but not least is that the Pilina that Kanaka Palestinians have is older than both of our occupations. 
there was a time before colonialism and occupation, and I promise you that there sure as hell will be a time after that, and that's what we're yeah. bringing forward. Yeah. speaking, I wanted to point out that one of the, the first point of contact was between, um, you know, when she's talking about the report, when Captain Cook arrived here in 1778, the first transaction was that, uh, you know, was for sex, basically. They, they, I mean, that was, we were on, women were on that front line. We were the first contact with um, these sailors. Um, and I also wanted to, uh, you know, just mahalo Ihirani for all of that research. I think that should uh, lay the foundation for that connection between Hawaii and Palestine. I'm gonna um, take it to Natalie, but um, Natalie, but I will um, introduce our other forum speaker. Her name is Laulani Tiale, Tio, a mother, an activist, musician, artist, peace worker. She's a cultural birth and traditional health medicine worker from Ko'olaloa, from Ko'olakoko, Oahu. She has been a frontline activist in major Kanaka struggles for three decades and does a lot of work in health issues related to activism and colonization. She's the coordinator of Ho'opai Pono Peace Project, which works to build and support peace on all levels, from community, cultural conflict work to the restoration of Hawaii as an independent country dedicated to peace, from which our steadfast aloha can be a major source of healing and demilitarization for the entire earth. She's also an apprentice traditional bard under Elder Hakumele Rico Martin. Is Rico here, by the way? Oh, yes, we are so honored. Rico Rico Martin's here, he's a legend. Um, aloha Aina, he, he was there at the beginning of our movement, literally, and he's still going. Mahalo, Uncle Iko, for, for coming. Mahalo. So thank you, Laurani, for coming. Um, and I was hoping Natalie could make um, some connections um, with your work in the North Dakota uh, pipeline protest um, and by an occupation. Um, and this is, thank you so much, everyone, for this great discussion so far. And at the end, I just want to say there will be time for questions, comments, from the audience, Mahalo. And then to Kai Pika Sekimanta, and Chata Lanchaiki, Nyoka Sutimi, Natali Segovia, Nyoka Osko, Pilman Takare. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Natali Segovia. I am Quechua from Peru, uh, also part of the Pacific. And honored to be here with you all. I'm grateful for the invitation to be here with these sisters that are doing this incredible warrior work. And uh, it's humbling for me and inspiring to see uh, youth coming up. Uh, I know I look like I'm 14, but not. Uh, I recently was in South Dakota and I saw an uncle that was eight years old. He's like, boy, you look a little older than the last time I saw you. He's like, I hope so. But uh, I'm, really, I'm really honored to be here. One of the things, as currently I'm the executive director of the Water Protector Legal Collective, uh, we started in 2016 at Standing Rock, literally formed uh, out of necessity, as so many organizations and, and frontline uh, efforts happen out of necessity, uh, in defense of over 800 criminal uh, cases that were brought by the state of North Dakota against water protectors, those that were standing, both indigenous and non-indigenous allies that were standing to protect the water. Uh, and also treaty rights, right, to protect the, the human rights, the rights of our non-human relatives, and specifically the water as a life-giving force. Understanding that water is something, yes, that unites us, but also has been weaponized against us and is continually weaponized because of the extractive industries that have been so often linked to the missing and murdered indigenous women pandemic within all of Avellana, Turtle, Turtle Island, right, North and, and uh, North America, or what is termed North America. 
And that has uh, been extended here, right? In, the, in, in all the information and data that Makaroni was presenting. Um, we've seen that in the context of missing and murdered indigenous women and that conversation, there is a lack of uh, empirical data and knowledge about what is happening in the Pacific. There's a lack of empirical data, and that includes Alaska. Right? Uh, when we're talking about impact, the impact exercises are also held in Alaska and have been destructive of, of the Arctic and have been destructive of the spaces where the U.S. military has constantly and had, uh, had a presence. So we're talking about militarization. We're talking about the militarization that comes and impacts our lands, our people, indigenous peoples of the entire world. But in particular, the violence that comes as a result of military occupation and the resulting militarization against our, not just our women and our uh, two-spirit folks, but also the land and the earth itself. And so that violence is something that we saw firsthand and experienced and have continued to deal with in the years since Standing Rock. Uh, to date, there is still information coming out about the Tiger Swan private military security company that was employed by energy transfer partners at, at Tiger Swan, and the effects to which, and the extent to which, they went to not just uh, believe and, and uh, perceive water protectors as uh, eco-terrorists, as jihadists, as militants, as insurgents, Right, when they were protecting the water, but also specifically targeting the sexual violence of women, indigenous women. Right, and so the, the link between extraction and indigenous women is something that has been studied extensively, particularly in, in the context of North America. But here today, one of the important links that I think is not as uh, talked about is the link with militarization. And that link is pervasive in the Pacific. When we're talking about the military presence worldwide, we're talking about over, some, some conservative estimates say 750 military bases worldwide. Other estimates and counts say over 1,000 military, U.S. military bases worldwide in over 80 countries in the world. When we're talking about the Pacific, in the Pacific alone, there are 400 military bases and over 300,000 deployed troops 60% of which include the U.S. Navy alone, also in the Pacific. Japan is the place with the highest number of U.S. bases, including 120 active bases, followed by Germany, and 100, which is 119, and South Korea, again in the Pacific, 73. And I know we have relatives here from Guam, and 54 in Guam. Here alone in Hawaii, there are 14 bases. When I was looking at the information, it fluctuated between 7 to 14, and I was like, what's interesting about it is that there is a, if you look at DOD records and the counts that DOD has, right, Department of Defense, they look at um, presenting information and lessening their, their footprint of how many bases, what qualifies as a base. When we're talking about military bases, we are talking about places, by definition, that are over four acres. We're not talking about other places that are also strategically used for military purposes. So that alone should, should give us an idea that not only are there over a thousand of these U.S. bases, over 400 military bases in the Pacific, but there's other smaller, you know, what they call lily pads, smaller than four acres, that are actively being used, right, and, and actively exploiting the land and the water. Uh, in all of the pieces that they are. <clears throat> and I, I know, Helani, uh, you've done so much work with Oahu Water Protectors, and we're so grateful, and it's one of the, the honors that we've had as an organization to be able to partner in some small measure with you all and also with Sierra Club of Hawaii that have done such incredible work to shed light on the impact of the U.S. Navy on the water, on the Hawaii, right, on how exactly the presence of the military has impacted the ability to even have existence here, right, to live. And that's ultimately what we're speaking about today, is that 
uh, when we have these uh, military in all its forms in the different places that it's been, uh, it impacts our ability to have the kind of air yeah, or the kind of life, the kind of not just sovereignty, as our sister said, but uh, self-determination is often the standard that's invoked at the international level. Under international law, self-determination is the highest standard that we look at in terms of human rights and the human rights framework. <clears throat> but what is uh, what's sort of missed in the English is really present in Spanish. And in Spanish, we, we don't say self-determination, right? There's the self kind of gets lost. It's libre determinación de los pueblos, which is the free determination of peoples, right? There is a praxis element in the self-determination. There is an active element in the self-determination. There is a fire that is sometimes uh, missing in the English of this practice of self-determination. One of uh, our elders and mentors who now joined the ancestors, Supa Enrique Costa, used to tell knock-knock knock jokes. And one of his knock-knock jokes was, you know, why did the chicken cross the road? To, he was practicing his self-determination, right? <laughs> and I, I think that's a great way to explain it to children, right? And to all of us, to understand that self-determination is a practice, <coughs> that it requires action, that it requires us to be active, that it requires us to be invested in a process that doesn't happen overnight, that, you know, I've seen chickens crossing the road here in Hawaii, <laughs> And uh, man, I'm worried for them. I'm like, there's a car coming this way. There's multiple cars coming that way. We have uh, Auntie Sandra Creamer here from Australia who's visiting. And she's like, wow, those chickens, they're, you know, they're crossing with their little ones. But they're making it across the road. Somehow they're making it. And the question is, like, how do we you know, learn from them you know, that somehow they managed to make it across the road unscathed each time. I'm like, oh gosh, they have like morphed into super chickens. Um, but also understanding that we have these challenges, right? That the, the road to self-determination is long and that we're here for a long game. When we are talking about, you know, um, Ilani said, you know, there was, there was a pre-colonization and there will be a post-colonization. The idea that we're in some kind of post-colonial world because you know Africa was decolonized and lots of places were decolonized and we like talking about decolonization, decolonize our mind, decolonize the university, decolonize, decolonize. What about indigenize? How about fighting for and imagining what are the things that we can invoke into, right, and pull into and call into the world that we want to envision? <clears throat> not just the world that we're trying to break apart or break down because of the things that have been part of the systems that are systemic, that oppress us, right? And the systemic oppressions that we have to face on a daily basis as indigenous peoples of the world. But because we're here today in the Pacific, you know, these struggles are related. That's part of why we had people here from Hawaii that were at Standing Rock, right? That connection was there. The connection that I know that there were people that came, you know, from our organization back to, to Mauna Kea in 2019. There is, there is a constant need for solidarity. There's a constant need for uh, that ability to understand that our struggles for liberation are united and they're one. As we look at, uh, it's hard to look at statistics, right? Makanalani was sharing a lot of the statistics at the, at the outset, and there's more, right? When you take the time to look at the statistics, it's a really grim picture. And it's a picture that I know each and every one of you walking in the door today already knew in some small measure, right? In some small measure, the fact that you're all here and those that are tuning in on Zoom, like the reality is that you came because you have an interest in learning more. But how do we get the people to, to communicate these issues to people that are not in the room, right? How do we tell people that these are some of the grim statistics that we are affronting as and confronting and have to deal with as indigenous peoples of the world? And in the Pacific, why is this something that is so important? <clears throat> Helene, uh, I saw your tweet the other day about FESPAC, yes. and I was reading it to uh, some folks. You know, Helene... Well, <laughs> I'm a truth teller. 
So for those that didn't see Helani's tweet, Helani said, you know, one of the things, like, why... I was talking to my partner, who's Kanaka Maui, and is here today in the Red Mauna Kea, uh, Kiai Mauna, uh, Kukiai Mauna hat. Um, but, you know, I was, I was telling him, I was like, nobody's... We were talking, nobody, in, in the context of FESPAC, nobody's actually brought up militarization, right? There was like maybe one person that kind of started talking about it, but there's a fear to talk about what things are that we are all seeing that is absolutely present in the Pacific, right? And uh, Helani said, well, on Twitter uh, that I happened to read, she said, you know, how are we gonna talk about it at FESPAC if one of the sponsors of FESPAC is the military, right? And if you look at the FESPAC sponsors, it's military base after military base after military base, and we forget, or we don't forget, Hawaii is the Indo-Pacific Command, right? We're like, I, I'm not Hawaiian, but when I land on Oahu sometimes and it flies over the military bases, my blood boils. Because it's, that, it, it's an indigenous understanding of what the militarization has done across the world and continues to do here in this land on this aina and for the vai here, right? and for the people here. And Makana Lani, um, when you talked about the children, you, you uh, sped through this part, but I was like, Linger on this one, because it's you, you talked about children under the age of 15. Just let that sink in for a minute. I am sure you have nieces, nephews, sisters, somebody in your family under the age of 15. This past week, we put some information out on the impact of militarization and uh, water in the Pacific, but also on missing and murdered indigenous women uh, from Water Protector Legal Collective. and. I have to say that we had to, we decided against publishing a long list of statistics about Okinawa because the statistics were so graphic that it was too much. Even for us as a legal organization that have to see constant information that is harrowing. But I'm saying it here because it's important for us to understand that the kind of violence and the kind of sexual violence that we see explicitly from the military is not just women in the grown women that are making decisions to go to a military, right, and making decisions in, under duress. We're talking about co coerced decisions. It's not an active choice, right, when it's under duress. But in Okinawa, what has come out is children, right? We're talking about from the ages of zero, zero, right, just born to the age of 15. And so that is something that I don't think we can gloss over. It's something that we have to recognize. And it's something that, you know, without um, engaging in, in uh, trauma porn, right, which is also something that's difficult today because and we, we all bring, as indigenous peoples, like historical trauma, epigenetic trauma, we carry that with us. But we also have to be able to confront these statistics and understand that it is part of the reality that we are fighting against. So that our relatives that are from the ages of zero to 15, from the, our women, our elders, don't have to experience this anymore that the stolen generations, right, of those that were at boarding schools, those that were, uh, had to be separated from their families, the missing and murdered, it's not just missing and murdered, they don't magically go missing and, and, and they don't magically appear murdered, right? This is something that happens because somebody is doing this. At line three in, uh, it's, it's by Enbridge, the Canadian company, in Minnesota, uh, there were over 900 arrests from uh, water protectors that were putting their bodies on the line to protect uh, the water in Minnesota. And one of the things that came out of line three is that there is an understanding by corporations, right? Just like there is an understanding by the military, but there's an understanding by corporations that their actions 
lead to extraction, and their extraction leads to violence against women. And so Enbridge was required by the state of Minnesota to have a public security fund. This was several million dollars to deal with the foreseen effects of human trafficking. So what that meant was that they expected that at line three, because of the extractive pipeline that was being built, there would be indigenous women that would be trafficked. And they were required to have a fund to not only help with the law enforcement and the policing, but also to defend, right, to finance the defense of pipeline workers that would be charged with cases for uh, trafficking in the context of, of line three. So in some ways, you know, people saw this, advocates saw this as like, okay, this is a partial win. I mean, it's horrifying that we're talking about it that way, but it was a partial win because it was a recognition that corporations understand what it is that they're doing, right? And understand that their actions have a direct effect on not just the earth and the water, right? But also on our women, on our girls, on our two-spirit relatives. So the question is, when is that gonna happen with the military? And the reality is that it's not gonna happen unless we push for it. Because these kinds of cases are wrapped up in uh, military uh, tribunals, right? These cases don't go into the court system. When was the last time you heard about a military person, right, service member that was dragged into a public, a court? in a public system. They go through private tribunals, and so they, they escape the traditional areas of the law. And so we have to look outside, right? We have to look at other ways. Maybe it's international law, that's one area. But as Ihilani said, you know, the UN is a great venue, but it's not the only venue, right? Like we saw with Oahu Water Protectors and the Red Hill fight, I talk about it often when I'm talking to law students that are going through and studying law and, and you know, saying, oh, okay, you know, I want to become a lawyer to affect change. But the reality is that the law is sometimes opposed to that change that we are fighting for. And so what do we have to do? People take to, right, we saw Ernie Lau from the Board of Water Supply and, and really partnering with the people and seeing that collective change, that through collective change, we can actually accomplish something. And so uh, I think I went off uh, script here, but really um, just to say that I think we have an opportunity. This is an incredible opportunity not to be only in this space with all of our relatives here, but also to be able to share the information that we do have, right? Not to shy away from the statistics not to shy away from the quantitative because we have to know it. We have to be able to communicate in some small measure, in some small way, what it is that we already know because it's lived experience, because we have seen it, because our relatives have experienced it, because we know that it affects our, our lands, our waters, and we know that it's affecting our future generations. Right? How do we know, how can we have future generations if, the, if they can't drink the water? Right? How can we have future generations if they're being exploited, right? And they're being trafficked. We can't. So we have to find a way to bring other people in and into the spaces that they, they aren't and share and, and educate um, our relatives so that they can really truly understand what it is that we have seen for a long time and understand and know. Thank you so much. Hello, oh, that was beautiful. Thank you so much for that. And I just wanted to say to, you know, as an Oahu water protector, it was the people who shut Red Hill down. And I want to recognize the Oahu water protectors in the room. Rebecca, is Jamaica here? Jamaica. It was all of us collectively that stood together, and it was our voices that brought the, the Navy to a point where they shut an actual base down. That's never, there's, that's never happened, ever. So, and um, also, you know, 
just I just one comment about um, the fight for liberation and self determination. It's no longer a political fight. It's a fight for our future, because we this the way things are going now under occupation is absolutely. I mean, we're going we're in a trajectory that will take us downhill. Um, we're fighting for the lives and the futures of our children and our grandchildren. Liberation is a fight for life right now. Because of climate change, because of the rising seas, we're on the front line, we're the canary in the, in, you know, in the coal mine. Um, islands are disappearing. So, and, and, and you know, people always say, well, you know, Helene, you're on so many different issues. Well, heck, we're fighting a systemic power, right? So our resistance has to be systemic. If we have to make those connections again. The Vai, the military, the Aina, the, the women, I mean our children, it's all connected. And if we cannot get, because they've, they've programmed us to see things, you know, to compartmentalize things in, in our world, like Fanon says, right? The, the colonized world is a compartmentalized world. We need to, we need to make those connections again. So, and um, I just, mahalo, you know, as a water protector, it's, the vai is, when you, as, as kanaka, the water is the kinolao, is the physical manifestation of our spirit. If we lose the vai, if we lose the water, then we lose our spirit, our uhane. So that, you know, vai is in everything, it's in us. And so the fight for vai is the fight for life and liberation. And I just want to hand it off to Laulani. <laughs> Mahalo. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Mahalo. So, uh, Rimpak. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, about just my own experience because I've been doing this for a while. We've all we've been doing this. There's some of us, Kalama Le, some some of Uncle Liko um, have been doing this for a really long time. I really want to acknowledge that Uncle Liko has literally been uh, an activist one year longer than Rimpak has been in existence. <laughs> I shouldn't say, I, I don't think he's been an activist actually longer than that, but um, that was since Kalama Valley was, was a year before RIMPAC started. So that's um, a well-known struggle that began uh, what we know of as the Kanaka Maoli movement. So um, in this, you know, RIMPAC started out every year and it, then it went to every two years. And since then, we've been fighting it every two years. You know, so every two years, we launch whatever we can. And every two years, we say, OK, we're going to start early next time. We're going to be, um, you know, we're going we're gonna to start the year before. And we're going to totally organize this. and then everything else happens you know one battle after another because we have to remember that rimpac is one of the manifestations of the united states military and also all of the collective militaries of the world who are bombing and destroying our land and ocean, you know, to that whale out there who is being um, hit with sonar and therefore, you know, um, breaches and gets the bends and then shows up mysteriously dead or dying, you know, on our shores. It doesn't actually matter to them whether it was a United States bomb or one of their somebody else's bomb that was, were all tied in. Even the quote-unquote enemies of the United States 
because of the war games, because of the triggering, because of the industrialization, the arms show, let's face it, that's what RIMPAC really is at its fundamental core. It's a trade show for possibly the worst trade on this planet, war, yeah? Um, I want to, um, I, I feel like so many people had so many good facts about RIMPAC that I want to actually go a little bit to what the opposite of this is. You know, there's, there's, RIMPAC is the largest military exercise in the world, you know, and we're talking about the biggest and the baddest countries of the world getting together to bomb the largest ocean in the world, right? And to do the most destruction that can be possibly done um, by in that ocean. So, what's the opposite of that? Is the question. And I'm gonna say that it's us. It's us here, here, right here, right now. I mean, honestly, when I walked into this room, I came up here, I was like, whoa, I got, I was like kind of blown away because, I mean, here are, um, you know, my sister's in struggle from forever long, you know? My sister's in struggle that I just met in Geneva, you know? My sister's in, my, in my sister from Guahan, my other sister over here from, from uh, the land they call Australia, you know? And we know each other from all of these different places, but why, why are we here? You know, it's not just to fight RIMPAC. It's beyond that. The, you know, there is another, a whole new thing that is coming up. You know, the young people, I see Ulu, Kanoa, you know, the uh, Mima, the, the young people. Every year, every moment, you know, all of the, are different kinds of people coming together. We are creating a world. And that is so, 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 so important in the picture of things. You know, my program, Ho'opai Pono Peace Project, right? We get dissed a lot because, ah, peace, you know, people are like over it, you know, because, <laughs> because, you know, it's, people have this idea or people have been told for a long time that, oh, peace is when you just, you know, find this little balance in yourself and you, you know, and you find calm and, you know, and you just basically put up with all the bullshit, right? And that, that's the idea, but what is peace really? And that's really what I want to get to. What, what does peace really look like? And I'm gonna say it looks like this room. Look, look, just take a look around. You know, look at the diversity. Look at the skills, look at the strength. Look at the, look at the determination. Look at the love. You know, and I'm gonna say peace has some ingredients to it. It's not the absence of war, but it is the opposite of it. And the, it, the reason is that it has these specific ingredients to it, at least from our cultural perspective, and I'm sure that in all of our different cultures, we have these same understandings, right? We have these fundamental understandings of these things, even if we call them something different. So, aloha. You know, aloha. I, you know, I want to acknowledge um, my, some of my mentors um, all came from the same mentor, same teacher, 
whose name was Pilahi Paki. And she had a very famous say saying, you could even say it was a prophecy, that um, when the world is hurting the most, when the world is, you know, when it, in its quest to find peace, because it comes to that point where it needs to, it will turn to Hawaii. And the reason it will turn to Hawaii is because we have the key. And that key is aloha. And it is very, very important to understand that in that prophecy, it's absolutely true. But we're not talking about aloha in the jar. You know, we're not talking about aloha, you know, that is funded by the, you know, whatever, the various, <laughs> or whoever, you know, the state of Hawaii. It's not in the box aloha we're talking about. We have to look at what the ingredients of aloha are right now. The, uh, the ingredient, one of the crucial ingredients in aloha right now is resistance. Without resistance, we don't have truth. And without truth, and, and we don't have action, because truth and action put together kind of lends itself to resistance, yeah? And that in turn is part and parcel of aloha. It's the manifestation of aloha. That is what that prophecy speaks to, is that manifestation of aloha through resistance. Because as we encounter the opposite of peace, which is militarization, war, destruction of the earth, we are tasked with building true peace on true aloha, on true resistance. And right now, if you look at the world, you know, here we are facing RIMPAC, where the United States and Israel are bombing Palestine and bombing Hawaii, right? There's some significance there. We're talking two ends of the earth, like quite literally, right? It's kind of like the two ears of the, of the planet, yeah? And I'm going to say, if we can build peace from Hawaii and Palestine, we actually can achieve world peace. And this isn't some lofty kind thing now. This is, we're talking about a necessary ingredient for survival of our future generations. As Helani said and Natalie said, you know, we will not have future generations if we do not achieve world peace. Because if we do not achieve world peace, the quantity of nuclear bombs on this planet and the attitude of those who hold them are not that hard to do the math on, right? And we are in the most danger. If there's going to be one bomb going off anywhere, guess where the single most likely place that's going to happen is? Because we're standing on it. Yeah, we're standing on a place where every corner of this island has a nuclear base. And keep in mind, of course, we always need to keep in mind, we are in, ironically, the country, Hawaii, that pioneered the concept of neutrality on the world stage and for the purpose of stopping militarization in the Pacific. And that is our country. It is our mission. It is what we fundamentally are, who we are. And when we stand and we stand together with every single other sister, brother, mahu, everybody who has their own manifestation of that air, 
yeah, of that aloha, of that resistance. When we all stand together, we can, in fact, lift that blanket of colonialism. Because it cannot be lifted just in one place. This is a global matter. And you know what the fundamental ingredient there is? Consensus, and which is based on consent. If you think about it, consent is the threshold of peace. Because if you have no consent, you have no peace. You know, TMT, so there's a good example. If we, I'm pretty sure we're very clear, we do not consent to TMT, yeah? So if somebody goes and tries to build TMT, then that is an act of aggression and because of the nature of um, our country being illegally occupied, it is an act of war, yeah? And multiply that by all of the different heva that are happening all over the world, not just to the indigenous people, yeah, but to the planet, to all of the people, And we, who have that koleana of holding that aloha in all of its forms all around the world, we have that power to collectively lift it. And it is through things like RIMPAC, ironically, right? It's through this awful, horrible devastation and almost annihilation, almost annihilation of our peoples that we are coming together and that we suddenly have that power that we did not have before. So we have that power to lift that blanket. And we all need to grab our corner in our own way. Some people get, you know, some, some people have the ability to hold it like this. Some people are holding it like that. You know, some people have an artistic way of holding it. Some people have a full-on kue way of holding it. Some people have um, an academic way of holding it. Whatever the case may be, the musical way, the many, many different ways, we in all of our different ways, it is going to take every single one of us standing together and lifting that with and using the power of our ea, the power of our aloha, the power of our pono and our understanding of that pono. And each of us with that understanding lifts that beyond RIMPAC, beyond militarization, beyond all of the heva, you know, and it will take each one of us. So, you know, on one hand, I feel kind of bad about like, oh, not organizing earlier, like last year, I meant to do it last year, I meant to do it last week, I meant to do it one hour ago, you know, <laughs> but no, I was rushing in late. You know, because there's like a lot of things to do that we collectively, and it takes all of that, right? We, all of that kuleana, that duty that every single one of us have are absolutely crucial. And in coming together, in building that together, in having the aloha for one another, and building that strong and building our skills in real peace, which again requires real resistance and it requires real understanding too. You know, the colonization is, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a crazy, crazy game that hurts everybody, including the colonizers, you know? I mean, it's kind of like musical chairs, right? When, try to, when I've tried to explain um, colonialism to little kids, I kind of like 
go to like musical chairs, you know, there's, there's this one guy and he's got the record player or whatever, you know, he's got the, he's controlling the music and he keeps stealing the chairs. You know, we don't know where he's putting them into his bank account probably, but you know, he's, uh, he's taking those chairs and swiping them out for himself. And meanwhile, everybody else is running around and trying to sit in some chair and it doesn't matter whose chair it is, right? They're just about like, oh my God, I gotta find a chair. So I think it's really important to understand that game and then counter that game. So when we deal with militarization, we deal with this kind of heaven, we deal with the contamination of our water, the destruction of our land, these ridiculous, um, games of lease renewals and, you know, EIS processes and all this crazy, crazy stuff that it's like, you know, we're like whack a moleing it all over the place. We need to remember that fundamentally our true kuleana is to those very, very simple things. It's to each other. It's to Ea, to manifesting our Ea. You know, then we gotta remember that's the thing about that's the thing about Ea as sovereignty. It's not held by anybody else. It's not held by no no president, king, government, nothing. I mean we do have collective Ea, for sure, right? We have collective Ea. And that collective Ea is what is going to manifest in our resistance to bring up that power, to lift off that blanket, to, you know, to overcome that game, to start building that new world, that new paradigm, that new true peace on earth that is a very, very, real thing. It's not some lofty who knows what. It's why we're all here. And if we can build that in Hawaii by standing for Palestine, for standing for the Kanaki people, for standing for all of the people, for Guahan, for, for every single Ukinai, for every single people of this world. We stand together, we stand for one another. And in doing so, we build that peace. We make it happen. We manifest that air. And we, we carry forward that indigenous Manao, even those who are not indigenous to the one particular place, you know, will be, ca will be helping to move it forward because the indigenous peoples of the given place fundamentally are indigenous because we have Goleana that came from the very first people and are going to the, to the forever people who will always, always, always be here. And I, I want to like, um, close with um, a, one little piece of mana'o that, uh, seeing Kalama, I thought of your mom, Auntie Gwen Kim. And she always had this saying that, you know, one thing you don't ever have to worry about is missing the opportunity to address uh, colonialism because one thing you can always count on is that they're gonna do something else just as stupid <laughs> yeah that's the one thing she like drilled that one into us so we should have time to take care of ourselves take care of each other and keep going Ho'omau. Mm -hmm. Mahalo, Lali. 30 years, yeah. over 30, maybe 40, I don't know, in the movement. Um, and I just want to recognize, I want to end with Tina. She's online. Um, and um, Tina Nata, she's from Aotearoa. 
and she has been an inspiration to me um, as a Kanaka Maoli, outspoken a Kanaka Maoli here. <laughs> She's outspoken in her homeland, so we have a lot in common. But um, I just want to recognize who's here. I mean, um, so I see some people from Aotearoa, some of our cousins from Aotearoa. Can you um, stand up? If you're from Aotearoa, or raise your hand so we know. <laughs> Mahalo for coming. Yeah. Um, I heard Guhan. Guhan? Guhan, yeah, sorry. Guhan. Mahalo. Anywhere else? Oh, Australia. Um, Sandra. Aloha, thank you for coming. Welcome to Hawaii. Um, any other relatives from other places here? Um, mahalo for being here and mahalo for being part of this space. I think we have over 100 people on Zoom as well. Um, so when I, I wanted Tina to kind of just wrap it up for us and then we wanted to hear from you folks. But um, mahalo Tina for, for being coming into our space. Um, and standing in solidarity with us here in Hawaii. Um, it is one of those uh, important times, you know, with FESPAC and RIMPAC and all of these things convening here in Hawaii. Um, it's important to have these discussions um, with each other. But thank you, Tina. Mahalo. Oh, Is that better? Oh, yeah. yeah. You can hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. Then I'll go. Um, Kia ora nha lani. Can you hear me okay? Thank you so much for the invite. And what an honor. I just really wanted to honor these amazing wahine. Um, It's just giving me life. Listening to the order or just the, the height. The, the, the height of the corridor and the, analy you know, the analytical mouse between you all is really humbling and amazing. So I just want to talk about all of you. You really are a testament to the power of Wahine and Indigenous women when it comes to framing, you know, liberation and justice, global justice and Indigenous justice. So thank you so much uh, for the invite. It was wonderful to sit and listen to the corridor. Um, as Helen mentioned, um, I'm, uh, my name is Tina Ngata, I'm a Ngati Proewa from um, the East Cape of the Ika Maui, um, Aotearoa. Uh, I just wanted to honour, um, you know, Kalakui and Helani and all of the work that is done there for the militarization in the Amwana region. Uh, I'm an anti-colonial scholar. I say that very deliberately because I do believe deeply in the importance of weeding Amada from invasive species in order to allow our native to flourish. So I support uh, re-indigenization, but that I also believe that that has to come with anti-colonialism as a fundamental step in re-indigenizing our spaces because these colonial forces have become very good at hiding in plain sight. So we do need to like look at and observe the colonial processes at a local and at a global level, right? Because colonialism was a global project. And, and so I, I wanted to again acknowledge the incredible connections that have been made here across various movements around the world to be able to connect the story and, and get some perspective on the global transnational nature of the colonial project. Uh, you know, we, we know that one of the discursive tools of colonization is to domesticate our oppression, is to consistently get us to believe that our oppression is only happening at a local level or at a national level. They don't want us to see the global connections because then you start to think about how we can globally connect, which is where the real power is when we start to globally connect as well. We've seen that indigenous rights, discourse, and movements have actually brought the world to an anti-colonial moment. 
where the world is challenging the righteousness of colonial states like the US and the UK and, and even our nation states, Australia and New Zealand. And so we're at a, a time now where we're really primed to make good on this, on this leadership that we have always held in indigenous circles. Um, so I wanted to celebrate that also um, that was coming forth in everybody's portable tonight. Uh, and you know, it's just, it's so clear to see a lot of these colonial relationships at the, at the, at the international level. I wanted to acknowledge, you know, you're so right what you said about the UN is one space, but it's a very compromised space. You know, Israel, New Zealand, Australia, UK, Europe, and uh, and the USA and you know so-called USA and so-called Canada. In the UN, we are one voting block. We're one regional block. Of. It is not based upon geographic proximity like all of the other regional blocks. Our our regional block is based upon our shared experience of colonialism. So we can see that there's colonial relationships, international colonial relationships, are still very present and defining the way in which we shape our alliances. And one of those key alliances at the moment is AUKUS as well. You know, the Australia, UK, US and Canada, uh, sorry, Australia, UK and US military alliance and New Zealand is increasingly becoming a part of that. And that is also, along with growing tensions between China and so-called USA, is collectively contributing towards French colonial violence in Kanaki. Where an orlic mark of genocide are also being met by the French military. And where young Kanak are being shot in the streets right now, like a couple of months ago, having flamethrowers utilized against them on the streets because France wants to maintain its strategic military positioning in our Mwana region in the same way that the US does. And they want to fulfill their clearly stated ambitions in the 2021 Indo-Pacific strategy as well. That's why they're carrying this kind of violence out. Because the Moana region is so strategically important to them. And they will tell us, you're just a little island. You know what I mean, Mike? You're just a little island. If we were all just little islands, then why are you so invested in our region? I'm holding military domination of regions because they are so economically and militarily strategically important to the global colonial project. Israel is such a core part of that because they've trained more core police and military forces that have been utilized against indigenous movements around the world than anywhere else in the world. Mossad and IDF have trained people to be to to brutalize indigenous people around the world as well. So, but when we take this kind of global perspective and look at this as a transnational perspective, we see that you know the global project has infrastructure, and and that you know the fact that we are inconsequential is a is a very convenient colonial fiction that they try to get us to believe. But as our sister Sina Brown Davis says, indigenous rights are the roadblock to militarism. Standing together against militarism from an indigenous space does actually and has demonstrated to have the power to have interest to deliver infrastructural growth the global colonial military project. And I also wanted to acknowledge also Helani that you pointed out that there is a history to this rooted in the doctrine of Christian discovery. That this is and that sexual, you know, um, sexual misconduct and sexual crimes, military sexual violence has been a part of this history from the invasion of the Cook into the Moana region and still is the case right now. So we still see these things coming up, you know, across history, but still now into across Great Teo Island, Abiyala, and of course in, in the nation of Hawaii, in Guahan, in Kainaki, in Okinawa, sexual military violence is still present across all of those spaces and has been across time. So it's vital that we understand that the colonial project relies upon these transnational relationships it's vital that we connect transnationally as indigenous nations. It's vital that we call out militarism and that we stand in solidarity. We have a solidarity day for Kanaki on the 26th of July, which I'll, I'll get all of the information out to you through Kalangui for that as well. And this spirit military force is boo that holds the global colonial project together. You would not have colonialism without militarism. 
So it's vital that we never allow militarism to compromise our, our identities because they have, as our brother Tupac Aposta used to say, you know, that colonial machines become very sophisticated in co-opting indigenous Okay. They do that through recruiting indigenous people into the armed forces. Yeah. They do that through indigenous optics, through green, blue, and brown washing. And in the same sense that we must uphold the indigeneity of the Palestinians who have always been present right, against colonialism, we also have to refute in Israeli uh, propaganda position for thousands of in spite of whoever the military funds or whatever function that they try to, you know, culture line, they try to, we have to always recognize militarism for what that is. It's the glue that holds colonialism together. We have to recognize indigenous power and the power in our solidarity and resistance as well, so that we can be the roadblock to military violence around the world. So thank you again, everybody, for making those points so salient. Mahalo, Tina. Thank you so much. Uh, you always inspire, and I knew you would have a good wrap up for everybody. <laughs> but thank you so much, and that and that ends. And and go to sleep. I'm sure it's so late over there. I'm so sorry. Uh, uh, so if anybody has any comments or questions, we have a few minutes left. Um, it's 8:17. We can go to 8:30. And then um, at 8.30, we'll have um, just a small presentation from Ihilani, or sorry, not a small presentation, call it my, uh, you know, a, it's gonna be a powerful presentation, I know already. Um, but yeah, just a few uh, minutes, if anybody has any comments or questions, uh, we have one in the back. Yeah, this is for the panel, uh, anybody online, anybody in the audience, I got three quick questions, I boil them down, thank you. Uh, my name is, Thomas Brand. I've lived here 45 years. I'm not local, but I feel like it now. So, um, number one, who would you say are the best scholars in the indigenous sovereignty space who are imagining post capitalist and post nation state futures? That's number one. Number two, related, who has put the most thought? Sorry. No, I, I think we should, we're not going to go with you. We're going to move around. Um, he's been here before. Sorry. Tell him I, does anybody else have any questions or um, things to say? Yeah. Aloha. Half a day. Oh my gosh. So wonderful to see all of you. Um, so good to see you. Um, I just wanted to make a, a comment about Guahan. Uh, being that we're the oldest colony in the Pacific. And so we have a lot of that internalized racism and white supremacy that feed into that, um, that same sort of conservatism. We have the same sort of struggle around conservatism and we're really seeing it right now in the violence uh, being that we, we in the, in the um, protests for Palestine. Uh, we're seeing it with a lot of white settlers who come to the protests to harass us, but we're even seeing a few of our own people coming to harass us at the protests, which is completely heartbreaking. But I also wanted to speak to the voting, the UN voting, because it's so important to also contextualize it from our Micronesian experience, because not only are we the oldest colony in the Pacific, we're the most militarized islands in the Micronesian region other than the Marshall Islands, right? And so um, when you think about the voting, right, Palau right now has four major military projects, and a lot of those are without the consent of the Palauan people. The Marshall Islands, of course, devastated, right? And then Guahan and the Marianas, there's a huge uh, military project in Tinian in the Northern Islands right now. There, so when Guahan is devastated by war, whenever we go into war, uh, the backup uh, places for the military to use the runways once our, the Air Force bases bombed in Guam, Martinian, and Palau, and Yap. So um, it's so important to think about. So Yap it being a part of the Federated States of Micronesia, the reason why these countries voted 
you know, against the ceasefire resolutions in the UN is also because of the coercive, oppressive relationship with the United States and with the hyper-militarization and with the, the, the so-called economic investment, right, that comes from that, those pressures. So just to contextualize that, because there was, there was a horrible backlash, of course, around the world. Like, who are these Micronesian islands? Who are these small islands in the Pacific? that are voting against this ceasefire, it's so important to contextualize it in that colonial relationship, in the hyper-militarization that's currently happening right now. So I just wanted to make that point. And mahalo, mahalo, mahalo. Sijus ma, sijan, then miga masi. You're also amazing. And uh, we just sense bulagonaiza and solidarity from our homeland. And thank you all so much for everything you do every single day. And your wonderful thread about Festpack. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, lo love you all so much. And so, of course, our Saina, Sandra, Sandra Creamer. So honored to see you here, Saina. So, Saina Masi, everybody. Thank you for making that connect, um, for bringing that up. That, that's actually really an interesting connection to um, Palestine. And I think all of anybody want to respond to that? Anybody? Okay. So, um, any other comments? That was a really good um, comment. Thank you. Uh, aloha. My name is Bibi. Uh, I grew up here, uh, and but I also have family like all over, and a lot of sisters all over that are part of MMIW, and like that really touched. I was like brought to tears throughout the whole entire presentation. Um, one of my sisters in San Francisco recently got murdered. That's Michelle Henry. Um, and you know, it's like really hard for the Mahu Vahine. Um, and I guess just as a young, young little Mahu, um, one thing I'm trying to do is like tackle that and like bring the sisters together. Um, and I guess like as like really powerful Mahu Vahine, and thank you for everything you guys have said. Um, what are like steps to like keep strengthening our girls, keep strengthening our communities to protect our girls? Because um, I'm really reaching. Because we shouldn't keep having our murdered and missing. Thank you so much. You know, we talk about, and I think they had talked about the data not being available and not probably on purpose. I'm so sorry for your sister. Um, but and this is this is one of the reasons why we made this gathering um, to start thinking about systems of safety for each other. Um, uh, we basically have to depend on each other, um, and it's good to have these spaces. We created the space. We set the table. Um, the discussion is about things that we that are important, and um, it's about our safety, right? And so just like our collective liberation, our safety has to be a collective effort as well. We need to literally hold each other, I mean, just arm in arm and be there for each other. Um, there's no way we're gonna fight this military industrial complex on our own. And, and I, hopefully, you know, this will start a new conversation about that. Any, you wanna say something? First and foremost, I just want to say that I see you and I see, I see our mahu, I see them. And, and um, what was your sister's name? And I, and I want you to, you know, in the, um, what, I, what I've been taught in the MMIWR, Murdered, Missing, Indigenous Women and Relatives, is that um, we say their names. So, yeah, I want to, if we can... If you are able to, I'm going to stand wobbly because we've been sitting so long. I think we should all stand and, and say uh, this Henry. relative's Michelle name. Henry. Michelle Henry. Michelle Henry. Michelle Henry. So I'll say, say their name. Is her. there or her? Okay. So when I say say her name, we'll say Michelle Henry. Okay. Say her name. Michelle Henry. Say her name. Michelle Henry. Say her name. Michelle Henry. Michelle Henry. Because, like my sis said, they don't, they don't cease to exist. Although stolen and taken, they become a revered kupuna. 
when one of our revered kupunas passed away, Kekuhi Kanakole said, Wa kua oi. You have become an ancestor. This person, our people, they return to the depths of Kanaloa, to the Iave. The same words that we see used to describe the ocean can also be described in the womb. And so, be, so even in our human form that we could not hold this person and we could not keep these people safe, our ancestors can and do and will. And so I know that this person, and all the peoples that we hold in our hearts and our minds, who have gone, they are in the hands of our ancestors. They are with this kind of law that we will so ferociously defend because they return to the placenta of Mother Earth, where they can be held in the womb in the sacredness that they should always be, be held with and revered with. So I thank you, and I pledge that we are here for you as part of the report, as part of your older siblings, your aunties. I pledge that to you, to the Mahu community, to walk beside you so that no more stolen sisters, no more stolen relatives. I pledge that to you, this report, we pledge that to the people and to Hawaii, to Hawaii as our foremother, as our foremothers and grandmothers. So mahalo, mahalo, mahalo and we're here for you. Mahalo. Thank you, mahalo. Okay, oh, that was beautiful. Thank you for teaching us that so that Next time, if someone else shares, we know now to say their name. Thank you, mahalo. And that's what's great about these spaces. Um, Kalama, and then Kalama will be our last speaker, and then we will, um, uh, Ihilani has a presentation. Aloha, mahalo to you, everyone. This is such a beautiful presentation, mahalo, Helani. You always make the palina, the, the, the weaving together, and I just really want to mahalo, um, you know, Makanalani, when 20 years ago I wrote an article about the impact of military Native Hawaiians, there was no data about Native Hawaiian women and the impact that happened. So I just aloha you so much for doing the research that you do. And really, Ihilani, I really want to work with you because I just love this history. I never, like, I've been working for 20 years with supporting and working in allyship with Palestine and Hawaii, and I never knew the things that you shared with me today. And so mahalo nui for that. I just feel so like inspired from the things you, you do. And I want to talk to you afterwards. And I want to ask um, everybody here, I'm going to be a part of the Freedom Flotilla going through. Um, um, we're going to challenge the illegal blockade by the water, by the IDF, by Israel. We are going to try to challenge it every year. They try to challenge this and bring 100,000 tons of aid to the Palestinian people. So this summer, we are striving to do that. So please, watch out for us as Kanaka Maoli, as a woman, as a physician. I'm going to do everything I can to bring the voices of Kamuwana Nui, not just Kanaka Maoli, but Kanaki, Guahan, Aotearoa, you know, Australia, all of our peoples, because we are connected by Amana Nui. And mahalo Nui to everybody here, because it is all of us who hold up our own parts of the sky, it feels small, it's those little that we're not doing much, and sometimes it feels like we're going to get crushed down by it. But because each one of us holds up our part of the sky, none of us are going to get crushed. Mahalo nui. Mahalo, Dr. Nihio. Um, her, both her mother and her father were part of the occupation at Kalama Valley, and which sparked our movement. So. She comes from a whole genealogy of, of Aloha Aina. And I'll hand it over to Ihilani to end it for us. Thank you. Mahalo. Um, I don't really have a presentation. It's more of a mele in the song that I'm, I'm sending over right now um, so that it plays. Let me just check this really quickly. Um, yeah, just let me know when you get it. Uh, I'll give context to the mele. I know we should be wrapping up soon. Um, this song was created about two years ago now at a protest. So lyrically is the, the best. 
Maybe not. Is the hook sick? I, I think so. Um, but this song is called uh, Drip Drop, and it was written in December of 2021, and that's when we got news uh, that Red Hill, not the first time, um, but like the, in like recent events, like thousands of gallons of jet fuel uh, leaked. And if you don't know, um, Kapukaki, Red Hill, uh, just miles from where we are, uh, there's 20 tanks in total. Uh, they're about 100 feet wide, but they're terribly created. So they were created in World War II. Um, President Franklin D. Roosevelt was in charge of construction, constructing these Red Hill fuel tanks. Oh, I took my slippers off, so I can't really see. But if you've ever seen a local slipper or a rubble slipper, it's, it's that thick. Not even croc level thickness of these Red Hill fuel tanks. And so um, in, in advocating um, and being in organizing, we know that folks don't need uh, the nitty gritty details of the ways in which our island has been polluted to understand or feel the effects of its pollution and its desecration. Um, and so I was at the protest, Kalel was there too, I believe, um, and a couple organizers were like, we need, a, we need a rallying cry, we need to pull people together. Um, and there were folks like flipping us off, honking us, like saying that we were ridiculous for trying to stop the US Navy. Um, but the fact is that it happened. And Hawaiians are no strangers to this struggle. We look at Koho'olawe. We got the largest military in the world to leave one of our most sacred islands. So what we're doing now isn't something new. It's a continuation of the legacy that a kupuna have left for us to resist colonialism. You know, and Hawaiians have been resisting colonialism since even before our occupation. Look at the life and legacy of our monarchs, Queen Lili'u Kalani, um, like George Helm, who is not in the Lee, but someone I consider a, a revered kupuna who have used this history and legacy of mele, whether it be pa leo leo, um, Hawaiian hip hop, or more traditional mele, to talk about our history and our story of, of us as being kaulananapo, the famous flowers of Hawaii. I mean, flowers aren't just meant uh, to be beautiful or to smell nice, but to be adorned. And you know, like when we're talking about olaika vai, the pua don't blossom unless the vai is there, and the vai isn't there unless the kanaka are there to protect it. Um, yeah, is the... All right, so we're gonna cue up this beat. Um, before I get that going, there's, there's a hook, and it goes drip, drop, the military we got to stop. Drip, drop, the military we got to stop. Two more times now, drip, drop, the military we got to stop. Drip, drop, the military we got to stop. All right, you can run the beat. It's just a little fun song. The kids love it. Run that beat. Where's that from? Um, Wild and Out. That's actually not a, a show we should bring into this conversation, but yeah. Run that beat. Oh, did you run it from the top? All right. Yeah, drip drop, Oli Kavai. And it starts off with the hook. Okay. Drip, drop, the military we got to stop. Drip, drop, the military we got to stop. Two more times now, drip, drop, the military we got to stop. Drip, drop, the military we got to stop. Acapella, let me take you back to 1943, the year that started this catastrophe when the fuel tanks were created by the military and Roosevelt was the president. Franklin D, there's 20 tanks in total. They're 100 feet wide, but they're so underground they'll never see the sky. They rest right above our largest aquifer, but this Ina is our mother. Get your hands off of her and now. Drip, drop, the military we got to stop. Drip, drop. The military, we got to stop. Two more times now, drip, drop. The military, we got to stop. Drip, drop. The military, we got to stop. No, this is only what we do. No, we're badging what we don't know. What a crisis is a time that was bound to explode. The US is nothing more than a war machine. With capitalism, reign supreme, matter of fact. HKT said it best when the US goes to war. Hawaiians lose their land. Just look at what they did to our sacred Makua. This Ana is our mother. They did nothing but abuse us. So drip, drop. The military, we got to stop. Drip, drop. The military, we got to stop. Two more times now, drip, drop. The military, we got to stop. Drip, drop. The military, we got to stop. 
and now my water's being poisoned by Uncle Sam. This is imperialism's master plan. So hands off our waters, hands off our daughters. We are not your sheep. You can take us out to slaughter, but keep in mind, the worst is not over. There's oil still leaking from the US Arizona. Been for 80 years, right into Pu'uloa. So we will not rest until this fight is over. So drip, drop. The military, we got to stop. Drip, drop. The military, we got to stop. Two more times now, drip, drop. The military, we got to stop. Drip, drop. The military, we got to stop. When I say land, you say back. Let me hear you land, 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 land. When I say Ola, you say Vai. Ola, 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 Mahalo Nui, Mahalo Nui, Ola, Mr. Vai, Ola, Kahunua, Ola, the Occupy Hawaii and Palestine. Eo, eo. Mahalo, everybody. Mahalo to our panelists. Mahalo to Teen Online. Mahalo um, to <laughs> Nadison <laughs> um, Owens, who's always you know helping out wherever she can. What is it? Um, Nijoni Online, who's been doing our Zoom. Um, mahalo to Purple Maya. And please, please um, do the um, the survey for Purple Maya for you, the use of this space, please. Um, and that's part of our agreement with them. I think we should be sending the link on Zoom for them to do the, the survey and then if you guys could fill that out as well. We have stickers in the front if you guys want. Um, and mahalo everyone for coming. Have a great um, rest of the week. And for you folks here from Festpack, have the re great rest of Festpack. <laughs> uh, thank you, mahalo. Oh, and there's more food. Please go eat. <laughs> oh, and there's tea. Oh yes, and we have the safety kit handouts. So for those of, of you who are in are needing that information, um, the safety toolkit for RIMPAC for women and vulnerable, um, um, you know, our vulnerable sisters and brothers, Mahu to Spirit, um, please grab one of those packets uh, and let's keep the discussion going. Mahalo everyone for coming.